Um, um, so I'm going to be giving a, a paper which is a, a different paper than the one advertised um, under the law of the ruse. Um, <laughs> the, but but the, but but the but with the with the um, with the provision that it actually makes the same argument in a, in a different uh, in a different key. Um, if the if the longer paper which I'm not giving um, is the is the gaze. Uh, then the, the shorter paper which I am giving is, is a glance uh, at that gaze. And it, we, all, we know that the glance has to come before the gaze, so in the proper, um, uh, you know, proper order of eros. Um, so, but let me just give you in brief the essential idea of the paper that I'm not giving, and then you'll be better able to perceive the gaze. Um, so that's called Synesthesia, the Mystical Sense of Law. Uh, it has three epigraphs, one from Merleau-Ponty who says, synesthetic perception is the rule, la regla. Uh, the second from Alexander of Aphrodisias, uh, who's one of the commentators uh, who really defines the concept of synesthesia, which is coined in commentary on Aristotle. For to everyone who senses something, there comes about, in addition to the apprehension of the thing that he is sensing, also a certain awareness, so nice thesis, of the fact that he is sensing. And finally from Wittgenstein who says, not how the world is, is the mystical, but that it is. So I'm interested in, um, in synesthesia as the very interface between uh, the sense of law and the law of sense. And, and really the paper that I, that I will give, I promise, is about um, this problem of, of, of what direct sense, how is it that we, where does it, the eye lands on something, how do we perceive also similarities and dissimilarities, uh, which are sort of of the essence of, of, of the, the perception of law as conformity uh, between disparate things. Uh, synesthesia is the law, I argue, because synesthesia senses without sensing it as such, law per se. The law of synesthesia reflects the universality of law as the unlimited binding of all things to the unknown and perhaps unknowable reality or truth which is beyond law. Synesthesia's inescapable necessity, the fact that nothing is ever sensed without something else being sensed with it, is of a piece with law's summit. The law of liberty or the law beyond law in Badiou's formulation traditionally identified with love as the principle of unity and absolute force of attraction which governs all life and being. As there is no inherent limit um, to what experience can confirm, there is no limit to the order of laws. Um, so now, that's just a little, a little, a little um, hint, I guess. The paper I will give is entitled, Because It's Not There, A Vision of Climbing and Life. And I'm looking at the problem of vision uh, in real, as yeah, as a as, as something that climbing climbs through, and that life as a climbing through, through vision. So to orient us, there's um, this great chart from Mayor Baba's book, uh, Beams, Beams on the Spiritual Panorama, which illustrates the the the, the, the sort of universal uh, process of evolution and involution. Um, beautifully portraying God at the beginning and the end of this, of this uh, uh, interminable journey, um, almost as two, as two eyes. And I'm fascinated um, by this coincidence of the eyes and this idea of the grip, of what we are in the grip of, and a vision as always sort of in the grip of something that it can never quite uh, see. So, Again, three epigraphs. The first from Pseudo Dionysus. Imagine a great chain hanging downward from the heights of heaven to the world below. We grab hold of it with one hand and then another, and we seem to be pulling it down towards us. Actually, it is already there, on the heights and down below, and instead of pulling it to us, we are being lifted upward to that brilliance above, to the dazzling light of those beams. And from Meister Eckhart, the eye with which I see God is the same eye with which God sees me. And from Clarice Lispector, the horror is that we know that we see God in life itself. The life of climbing is the climbing of life. Here I will try to see what this means by looking at vision, by posing the mutual question of life and climbing as a matter of seeing. 
Where does life take place? Before itself, to the one who sees it. Where is that? There, where it is, in its own being, wherever anything is, somewhere in the heart. As Augustine says, cor meum ubi ego sum quicum que sum, my heart, where I am, whoever or whatever I am. For who will dare to draw a line between life and being, to say, that is, but only this lives? Climbing concerns, in a special way, the openness of this line. As Golden Age alpinist Leslie Stephen put it, where does Mont Blanc end and where do I begin? That is the question which no metaphysician has hitherto succeeded in answering. At least this is how I am seeing it, that life, soul, is the inescapable taking place of being to itself, the miracle of its own visibility, the unbounded whole of one seeing being seen in the first place, at once middle and all. But to see things so, via the principle that whatever exists finds itself simply by virtue of its own existence, demands seeing beyond our eyes. As Ibn Arabi says, the whole world is intelligent, living and speaking. But the people of reflection, meaning intellectuals, say this is an inanimate object. It has not intelligence. They stop with what their eyesight gives to them while we consider the situation differently. The mystery of life fills the entire <coughs> world. And this is precisely how life sees, by seeing differently, beyond the seen, ri uh, raising and rising itself upon the shining chain of vision, climbing through the contradiction of its own sight. As Nietzsche affirms, life wants to build itself into the heights with pillars and steps. And I think this is Hermann's thing about uh, the, uh, the animal as a hypothesis that wants to change, it wants to, life wants to climb on itself. Um, build itself into the heights with pillars and steps. It wants to gaze into vast distances and out upon halcyon beauties. Therefore, it needs height. And because it needs height, it needs steps and contradictions between steps and climbers. Life wants to climb and to overcome itself by climbing. Likewise, to see climbing, to envision what it is and touch its life, requires holding on to it in all the endless moves of opposition and identity between seer and seen as a form of vision. To start, this means feeling the gravity of climbing as a wrestling with the blind grip of matter a struggle with the body as mirror or angel of vision. So Thoreau, reflecting upon climbing Mount Katahdin, says, I stand in awe of my body. This matter to which I am bound has become strange to me. Talk of mysteries, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense, contact, contact. Who are we? Where are we? To climb is to touch and fail to grasp like missing a hold that proves that the route goes, the location of vision, a place which, as far as I can see, is nowhere. Such is the essential idea, and remember the word idea means to see, uh, that, this e that this essay will attempt. The seam between life and climbing is the invisible way of seeing, a line descending and ascending something that is not there. For example, the supra-alpine altitudes of human contemplation that Petrarch, looking back with each descending step, remembers he is forgetting to climb in the ascent of Mount Bantu, or René Domal's non-Euclidean Mount Analog, accessible but unsummitable, the visible door of the invisible, or more literally, George Mallory's missing camera lost somewhere on Mount Everest. That the modern destiny of climbing is entangled with pre-modern forms of visionary desire is a no-brainer. I hope to explain, and not to explain one with the other, much less confuse them, or maybe just a little, as all vision between its eyes is somewhat crossed, but point the gates towards a higher bewilderment, one that before the totally awesome fact that there is such a thing as climbing, that climbing is possible, uh, unknows all the more what it is that climbing really climbs. What matters above all, given that we are already tumbled into the grip of climbing's all too human fact and the imperative to climb that life feels, uh, is less to critically and theoretically sort climbing out than face its life as the crux of itself. A term whose originally spiritual, uh, crux means cross of course, whose originally um, spiritual and hermeneutic meaning are worth bearing in mind. 
By poetically mirroring climbing through a mystical prism, one may perhaps glimpse something of the new that, never remain, that ever remains in the words of Mayor Baba, to be climbed with the eye of consciousness now fully open. Um, and in this chart, that represents the path of involution uh, in which the process of perception uh, is uh, reversed. And this is from uh, Inferno 5, uh, Doré's uh, illustration of the Divine Comedy. Um, those are the, lust, the souls of the lustful. Uh, the word route <coughs> derives from uh, yeah, the passion. It's a storm passion. They're, they're, they're enjoying themselves. <laughs> Hell, remember, is you get to be yourself forever. It's exactly what all your de um, desires are fulfilled in hell. Uh, the word route derives from rumpare, to break. In the Divine Comedy, the passage to paradise, descending through hell and ascending through purgatory, is literally that, a rupture. As Virgil explains to the pilgrim, after climbing down up through the center of the cosmos upon Satan's body, the inversely formed abyss and peak were generated by Lucifer's fall when the earth, quote, left this empty space in order to escape from him and fled upward. So the earth literally gets out of the way, like, oh, I don't want to touch this guy. Um, the void space of hell then becomes passable, crucially, by means of a series of ruins. Um, uh, the term in Dante is ruine, alpine landslides of ancient rock, which occur at the time of the crucifixion darkness, when, as Virgil explains in the seventh circle of Inferno, this deep, foul valley trembled so that that I thought the universe must be feeling love. Now consider this, the connection between rupture and the vertical path of visionary adventure as an allegory for the vital interface between climbing and vision. As climbing holds are paradigmatically comprised, and literally so, in the emotional moment of prizing them, of fractures, fissures, and similar features in an otherwise blank face, so vision ascends itself by means of essential breaks in raptured interruptions, which are synthesized into the whole loopy movement of living awareness in a world where, as Merleau-Ponty says, inside and outside are inseparable. The world is wholly inside, and I am wholly outside myself. Similarly, demonstrating the ecstatic continuity between seeing and grasping the space where one already is where one is going, and there is always dissolving into here, Heidegger describes the reach of human spatiality as one of deseverance. Deseverance, he says, amounts to making the farness vanish. That is, making the remoteness of something disappear, bringing it close. This is a 17th century painting of Augustine in this uh, beautiful moment of suspension or interruption, vision of truth, but in the midst of writing, but he's not writing, he's just the pen is, you know, there. Uh, and of course, it's grounded in the heart as the interface between the visible and, and the invisible uh, um, uh, worlds. Um, okay, the vital link between climbing and vision is seen clearly in Augustine's influential theory of vision. Commenting on St. Paul's rapture to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians, Augustine shows how sight shines through the simultaneity of three already scaled steps of intensifying presence and proximity, the corporeal, the spiritual or imaginal, and the intellectual. He illustrates this order of experience with the perfectly literal example of reading the second half of the double law of charity as if broken off from the first and greatest commandment, namely to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Augustine writes, when you read, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, three kinds of vision take place. One with the eyes, when you see the actual letters. Another with the human spirit, by which you think of your neighbor, even though he is not there. A third with the attention of the mind, by which you understand and look at love itself. The way in which each level at once breaks and coincides with the others becomes clearer if we consider their topological aspects. Corporeally, one senses an object that is something that seeing does not see through. And I think in object-oriented, you know, whatever, this, 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 this um, basic <laughs> fundamental fact is often overlooked. Object is often is just sort of treated as thing or something. But an object is something you can't see through. It's something 
So, you know, that's why God is not an object, because he, and it, actually that's how the invisibility of God was explained um, um, for some, you know, medieval thinkers. The divine being is so generous, it gets out of the way of everything. It lets everything <laughs> do its thing. So, uh, so, but there's a central blindness of the object, you know, an object is something you can never penetrate. But I guess that's, that's maybe the point of object-oriented ontology, too. Anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, well, that'll become clear. Uh, corporeally, uh, one senses an object that is something that seeing does not see through, a thing which is indubitably there, that is, you hit up against it. Spiritually, one senses an image that is a transparent medium perceivable between and across objects, a thing that is both here and there. Intellectually, one senses an idea that is an, an immediate truth or principle a form that is simply here. Or as Augustine spells it out, uh, one of the things which do not have any images that are like them without actually being what they are. Far from separating ultimate seeing, the vision of God, from ordinary seeing, Augustine shows how mystical vision of the divine reality is continuous with the general phenomenology of experience and perception. This is Bellini, St. Francis, so sort of illustrates that idea. Wait, there's no God in the picture, it's just a guy looking at the world in a state of ecstasy. To accentuate the connection to climbing, we may overhear in Paul's words the breathless expression of one who has sent a difficult project or climbing problem, in this case, on siding paradise, you know, doing it first try. A term whose Sanskrit analog, paradesha, means height or high land. I don't know how I did it, but I know that I did. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. Rather than being impossible, the inexpressible elevation of such spontaneous rapture is simply the actual summit of vision's natural elevation through which all seeing climbs. Likewise, according to Bonaventure, the most pure being, purissimum esse, of God is the first image of all intellection, the presence which the mind, in its blind habituation to, quote, the darkness of things and to the phantasms of sensible objects, willfully disregards, not taking note of that which it sees first and without which it can know nothing, almost like the blank page. In light of the traditional figure of vision as a ladder, that is climax or scala in Latin, on which there is a perpetual going up and down, this blindness is inversely equivalent to not seeing the ladder, the hierarchical scale of things, by failing to recognize through the principle of reflection or specular awareness <clears throat> that the first step is a step, that it is, not, um, that it is not all there is, but more truly a mirror and memory of other steps before and beyond it, a scale nece one necessarily descends in order to be here in this actual living form in the first place. Seen differently, the deep solidity of the sensible, the inevitable scandal of matter, and remember the word scandal, from, uh, also refers to climbing, scan means to climb or to leap over, uh, is a sign that it is to be ascended. This is uh, Dan's stepping stone, matter as stepping stone. The um, or as Bonaventure invites us to do in the itinerarium, stepped upon as through a mirror. Let us place the first step of our ascent at the bottom in Imo. Where else? It has to be at the bottom. Putting the whole world of sense objects before us as a mirror through which we may pass into, into God, the highest creative artist. So I'm really in love with this notion that the, the step, uh, the, the, I keep going over here because the, the, uh, yeah, the step uh, becomes mirror, or the world, when <coughs> stepped upon, turns into a mirror. This, this kind of um, beautiful um, transition. This is uh, Dupre's uh, painting uh, um, from 1500 of Jacob's, uh, Jacob's ladder, Jacob's you know, vision of ladders of the, of the angels descending and ascending the, the ladder. Uh, significantly, in the account of Jacob's dream, the ladder also bears a conspicuously liminal relation to stone, fulfilling its status as, um, uh, in Kaiwa's beautiful formulation, the shore of dreaming, l'ore du songe. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. 
So Jacob rose early in the morning, that is, after his vision, and he took the stone, which he had put under his head, and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it, forming the sacred threshold of his dream of the angels of God ascending and descending a ladder set up on the earth, Jacob's stone, the initiatory step of sleeping and waking life, shows forth the material ground of vision's elevation, indexing the hyper-solidity of the superessential, a reality who dreams in minerals. The pillow's becoming pillar symbolically intimates the inversive or paradoxical ascent of individualized consciousness via descent into unconsciousness. The souls climb into truth via illusion or untruth, or paradise through hell, whose last step mirrors the first. As Mayor Baba explains, the process of perception runs parallel to the process of creation, and the reversing of the process of perception without obliterating consciousness amounts to realizing the nothingness of the universe as a separate entity. The self sees first through the mind, then through the subtle eye, and lastly through the physical eye, and it is vaster than all that it can perceive. The big ocean and the vast spaces of the sky are tiny as compared with the self. In fact, all that the self can perceive is finite, but the self itself is infinite. When the self retains full consciousness and yet sees nothing, it has crossed the universe of its own creation and has taken the first step to know itself as everything. Um, and Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. Correlatively, stone typifies the first of the three worlds or kingdoms, that is mineral, vegetable, and animal, out of which life is made, and through which love flows in degrees, turning it back towards its own superessential reality via the chain of being. As Vossler says, summarizing the medieval view, the stone that falls to earth obeys the amor naturalis, or natural love, the beast that seeks its food or continuance of its species, the amor sensitivus, sensitive or aesthetic love, a uh, man who uplifts himself to God, the amor rationalis, or rational love. Or as Augustine more famously said, my love is my weight, by it I am born wherever I am born. This is uh, Wolfgang Gulick on the first descent of the climb in, uh, in Patagonia called uh, Riders on the Storm. It's a totally awesome route. Uh, yeah, this experience <laughs> per force proves this continuous and ultimate flow of life, the visionary climb and gravitational flight of the cosmic storm that has its all in its fatal grip, takes place only through great impasse by means of the ruptures aporias and ruins of love that lead onward through despair over and against the non-options of madness and self-destruction. So the climber, countering the force of gravity only by means of it, must evade and pass through the alter gravity of love's opposite, namely fear, above all the temptation to freak out and or fall to one's death. As love is the highest law, the law beyond law binding all laws, so does it correspond within the ontological chain of vision's descent ascent, not only to the force of synthesis that binds the chain together, but equally to the separations and breaks through which one link in the order holds to the next, the ruptures whose two actual inexistence, like the rungs of dreams, hold the truth and sense of the chain in the first place. The fact that it goes, and that's a climbing expression, I mean, the route goes, it can be done, it's possible. The fact that it goes, that reality is real, and its shining chain of vision, or as Kierkegaard calls it, this bridge of size, we all must walk. The fact that it unbreakably holds from here to eternity is realized through one's being broken upon it via visionary ruptures in one's corporeal, spiritual, and intellectual being among the most painful of which is the experience of being cut off from the ability to climb. Uh, but as Heidegger says, severing also is still a joining and a relating. Climbing is the climbing of climbing, a moving seizure of its own weight, an upstreaming of the first fall, the originary eruption of time or number of motion in respect of the before and after that somehow still never stops streaming out of eternity <coughs> through the spheres. 
As Deleuze writes um, in his commentary on Patrick Anglager's uh, famous climbing film, Opera Vertical, um, and capturing also the cinematic and extracameral perspective of climbing's visionary body, for it is not enough, he says, to prevail over gravity, but rather be able to make it stream continuously through one, and especially to be able to generalize this knowledge to every part of the body without allowing it to regroup at any time. So gravity also, love, that's the point, obviously, um, uh, as something that you climb by, by letting it flow, uh, as a spatialized figure in the head, so it can't you know, become head. Thus the body, to probably wrap up soon. Okay. Yeah, very close to the end. Okay. Thus the body must be broken apart into a veritable multiplicity of quasi-autonomous flows. Um, the climber's task is less to master in the macho form imposing sense than to engage the universe's wild and free unfolding through the morphogenetic capacities of the singularity. Um, furthermore, and here the link to the question of life uh, uh, and life as the spontaneous question or individuating whim of itself, comes more closely into view, the threefold order of vision, you know, that is Augustine's model, corresponds to um, the surchaotic leaps of cosmic evolution as described by Quentin Meissou in The Divine in Existence. So I'm kind of playfully illustrating those here. Um, so I'll skip over uh, that. Um, yet if one finds oneself adhering to the intuition that climbing and life are more intimately and universally related, such that these advents are not um, so much eruptions, but moves uh, upon the vertiginous and invisible axis of the eternal, then the vista becomes ever less concerning and more interesting. Um, uh, here, the created world, as Thomas Carlson says in the indiscreet image, is the vision of God in both senses of the world. From this perspective, according to which the gross, subtle, and mental spheres are not discrete domains, but interpenetrating globes, the perilous and singular evolution of vision, everywhere climbing over itself, is revealed as the endless and unfinishable expression of the fundamental unity of reality. Uh, as Deschardins said, to try and see more and see better is, is not just a fantasy or a curiosity, but the law that is imposed upon all life. So why climb, and what, are, what is one to do with this vision? Uh, wrong question. Um, or rather, the question of vision at the heart or interface of climbing in life is to be on, answered tautologously in a manner befitting the inherent purposelessness or wirelessness of this mysterious gift. I'm going to skip ahead just for the sake of time. Um, were Augustine... Uh, to, and that's the, that's the takeaway line from this paper, actually. The truth of Mallory's famous answer, uh, because it's there, lies in the fact of seeing that it is not. Conclusion. Were Augustine as passionate a reader of climbing problems as he was of scripture, he might have said that when you read X, the crux, uh, three kinds of vision takes place. One with the eyes, where you see the holds, one with the spirit, and a third with the mind, by which you see the ascent itself. Um, what, what matters to me is how, is how we can dis rediscover or uh, see the how climbing uh, vision is reflected in the climbing process. Um, how, how we can find it at, you know, at each of its levels. Um, namely, that of one seeing in bodies what uh, seeing cannot penetrate, which reflects an essential blindness. Two, seeing in images what is not actually there. And three, seeing in objects of of the intellect, what is here without really seeing anything at all, which, ref which reflects an essential senselessness and which can be connected to the uh, notion of the divine image, the mind's darkness to itself. Because it is not there. In other words, it, only see it seems that vision only ever occurs via a series of cryptic or hyper-intelligent moves between the breaks within its own continuity. And this is why, in the intensities of experience, one often appears quite clearly to see and feel and think almost headlessly. And this is captured, obviously, in this, uh, in this famous poem. And here I envision I mean, a painting, Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. And here I envision Augustine quoting and confessing himself in the margins, near the edges of the painting you are not seeing, 
Look upon me and see me, you in whose eyes I have become a question to myself. Who will turn to face this in inevitable gaze, the impossible look of life itself? Who can endure to the summit this pure will of vision, the living abyss of oneself that looks out at the world for no reason at all? And I'm going to stop there with that question.